My name is Greg Coles. I would describe myself as a celibate gay Christian. Uh, the, the, the condensed version of my story is that when puberty rolled around, I realized that I was gay and tried to figure out what I was supposed to do with that and didn't find any of the narratives that were being offered to me at the time for how to handle that, particularly compelling. This is Why I Stay, where we share stories of faithfulness in the face of judgment, confusion, and hurt. On this episode, we spoke with author, speaker, and worship leader, Dr. Gregory Coles. He has a new book out this year titled, No Longer Strangers, Finding Belonging in a World of Alienation. His first book, Single Gay Christian, A Personal Journey of Faith and Sexual Identity, was released in 2017. And his book announcement also served as his public coming out as a gay Christian. Greg was a leader in his local church at the time, and even though the reaction was not nearly as bad as he expected it to be, he still experienced deep wounds and hurts from his community. I wanted to know why Greg continued to remain a Christian and kept going to church, even though, in his own words, the church and Christians sometimes made him feel that his very existence was a mistake. Uh, I grew up overseas, actually, in Indonesia. I was attending... Uh, a cute youth group at an international English-speaking church uh, in my city, in Bandung, Indonesia. And one of the things that they would do in youth group is split the boys and the girls up. And that invariably meant, of course, that we were going to talk about sex. And so they would get all the boys together and they'd be like, look, boys, we know what you're going through. You want to look at pictures of naked women, but don't do it. And, and I discovered that I was like remarkably good at not looking at pictures of naked women. Uh, and, and so for a brief period of time, I thought that I was like the holiest 12 year old in the world. Cause I was like, they're telling me that all the boys are going to go through this. And I was like, I think I've been spared. Uh, and so interestingly, um, I think for some people, their, their awareness of their same sex sexuality comes as a result of their attraction toward the same sex. But for me, my first clue was actually the lack of attraction for the opposite sex that caused me to begin to say, this does not seem to be quite like the narrative I was told. Of course, when I did discover that I was gay, then that was like a grand crisis for me. Then I suddenly went from feeling like the holiest 12-year-old in the world to feeling like the worst possible 12-year-old in the world, the one who was so awful that nobody had even bothered to warn me that somebody hmm. like me might exist. So you're 12 years old, you go in the church, you're in Indonesia, and you realize that you're gay. Were there things you experienced, things you heard people saying in the church around you, in the culture around you, that made you feel that shame, like someone like you shouldn't even exist? In Indonesia, it's not considered unusual for male friends to just walk around holding hands with each other, mm -hmm. which obviously in the United States would largely be perceived as like a very gay activity. So, so I think that was actually probably helpful for me in that there's quite a bit of baggage that I know some of my gay friends who grew up in the United States around the same time that I was growing up in Indonesia mm -hmm. had to deal with that mm -hmm. I was like, oh, I think I heard rumors of that, but maybe to a to a much lesser degree. So in that sense, I was I was grateful for having having grown up in Indonesia and having grown up with with a very selected subset of cultural attitude. As far as the the sense of crisis or distress that I felt upon realizing that I was gay, I think for me, it, I felt it most on sort of theological grounds, as it were, um, that when it came to the discourse within my faith community, I heard very, very little about gay people. But the little bit that I did hear made it seem very clear to me that gay people were an entirely separate group of people from the people who loved and wanted to follow Jesus. And so to, to begin to recognize myself as somebody who might be gay was the first vestige of this threat that seemed like it might have the capacity to tear apart even my, my qualification for being a person of faith at all. Did you come out to people right away? I... I did not come out to anyone except for, by accident, uh, my my brother John. And he asked me some sort of probing question, and I couldn't think of a better answer offhand. And so I just kind of accidentally told him the truth. We had a short conversation, I recall, uh, and, and he was basically like, oh, no, like, you're not gay. You're, you can't be gay. He was like, you know, when you're going through puberty, you just have all this, all this sexual energy that could go anywhere. But, but that was the kind of 
that was the most encouraging thing he knew how to say was like, this is normal. You are normal. You could not possibly be this thing that you and I both had this shared understanding is sort of a, a categorical opposite of being a person of faith. Um, so, so that was the only, that was the only coming out that I did until I was 22 years old. Uh, but I figured I was like prayer I can do, you know, loving Jesus I can do. And so that was, that was the narrative that I, that I discovered and then attempted to make into the story of my life, uh, in those years in middle school and high school and college, just sort of praying and, and waiting and wanting and trying not to be gay and hoping to become a little straighter without, without great success, uh, clearly. <laughs> so you spend a decade trying to pray the gay away. Uh, you're living with a secret, you're going to church and you, you know, you feel that maybe gay people, it's a, it's a contradiction to be gay and to be Christian, but something happened in that time that made you feel like you needed to come out. Can you, what was that experience like? It was around age 24 that I came to the conclusion, I think at least for now, tentatively, I don't see myself becoming straight. And I also don't see myself pursuing an opposite sex marriage as a gay person, because I don't think that would be fair to my wife. I don't think that would be particularly wise for me. And yet I also don't find myself mm -hmm. convinced of uh, the biblical arguments that would say, that it, it works out for me as a follower of Jesus to pursue a same-sex marriage. And, and so I guess, you know, having eliminated all my other options, I suppose then I shall be celibate. When I first reached that conclusion, I, I can't say that I got there with like, there, there was not, I didn't throw a party at that point. You know, I, I, I wasn't necessarily super excited right. about this conclusion. And I reached the conclusion with the hope that I would manage to keep this mostly secret from everyone forever. Uh, huh. You know, in my ideal world, I was like, I will die with no one knowing that I am gay. And if right. people ask me why I'm single, I'll just evasively say that I feel like the Lord is calling me to singleness for now. <laughs> um, obviously the whole, like, I'll die with no one knowing I'm gay thing. Obviously it's worked out very well for me at this <laughs> right. point in my life. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was the dream. That was the vision. Um, uh, but uh, within within about a year after uh, having reached that conclusion, um, I, I began to feel a, a sense of pull in my heart uh, to to want to live my life a little more purposefully, uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, and specifically to live it purposefully with regard to my sexuality. Um, to to begin to dare to ask a question like if I, if God actually wanted me to do anything. And if anything included something that feels as, as awful and impossible to me as coming out, would I actually be willing to do that anything? Uh, so over the span of a few months, uh, when I was 24 and 25, I had a conversation with the pastor of my church, which is the church that I now work at. Um, had a conversation with him. I had a conversation with my parents. And around the same time, I was so, I was trying to write a novel at the time. I was working with my agent and kept having terrible writer's block working on this novel. So I went to my agent and I was like, Mike, I have writer's block. What do I do? And he said, you know, Coles, here's what you do. He said, you pull up a blank Word document and you just write whatever pours out of you and no one will ever have to see it. And I was like, this is sound writerly advice. So I pulled up a Word document and it just so happened because this was the summer that I was 25 years old. It just so happened that all the things that happened to pour out of me were all my musings and my angst and my uncertainty and my questions and maybe my answers about questions related to my sexuality. Uh, and, and so I started writing and I was like, I think I'm writing a journal. And then I looked at it again and I was like, I think this is like a really long journal or a lot of journals back to back. And then at some point I was like, oh dear, it seems I've written a book. So, so I took, so I took this, this accidental manuscript of mine and was like, I don't know if I should burn this thing or, you know, leave it in the archives to collect digital dust forever. Uh, eventually I decided that perhaps there was something of value within it. And so I ended up sending that book to my agent instead of the novel that I had promised him. Mm -hmm. And that book became Single Gay Christian, which is my first book, which was published in 2017. 
Uh, but that book was my coming out to the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I came out with the book. Literally, my coming out on Facebook was to take the pre-order link to my book on Amazon to post it on Facebook with this little message that said, Dear friends, I'm delighted to announce that I have a book coming out. Wow. Also, here are some other things that you should probably know about me. Uh, which was a grand way to make my to make my entrance into the public sphere. people react to that on i mean i'm assuming this is family and friends who have not ever heard you say that uh and then now you're releasing a book called single gay christian uh how was that responded to what how was that received it has been a it has been a challenging journey uh and and certainly at some points Mm -hmm. a heartbreaking journey for me i would be quick to say that i know loads of lgbtq people Whose, whose journeys, who the pushback they have received, the ways in which they have been rejected by family or community um, have just been heartbreaking um, and so, so much more uh, than I have faced. Um, my family uh, has been terrific, which that in itself is, is a gift that makes me uh, somewhat anomalous uh, in a lot of LGBTQ circles. Um, and, and by and large, uh, the... The, the friends and the, the fellow folks within my faith communities uh, have also received me really well. Mm-hmm. Now, I say by and large because I, I think I had a prediction before I came out, and this was probably another reason for my hesitancy, is that I was aware that there would be a certain degree of negative attention that I received upon coming out. Right. And, and I had predicted, I think, in my mind, roughly what proportion of positive engagement and negative engagement I anticipated having. I ended up having much more positive engagement and less negative engagement than I had expected, which again is not everyone's story. And I think is yet another way in which I have been very privileged in the conversation. And yet there's an interesting thing about your awareness that some of your interactions will be negative uh, and your inability to perfectly predict which interactions will be which Mm -hmm. That makes it feel like you're playing relational roulette every time you come out to someone new, every time you step through the doors of a new church and you just wonder what might happen. There is a, there is a kind of terror that comes with that experience. Uh, and, and there have been, there have been some interactions that have been sources of deep sorrow for me. Uh, and I, and I think sources of sorrow probably for the people on the other end of those interactions as well. Um, uh, I don't want to suggest that when things went south, I was the only one who felt the pain of it. I think there's, there's been pain on both sides, uh, in, in a number of relationships. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily think that pain is equally culpable on both sides, right. but I think I can honor the existence of the pain on both sides regardless. So why stay? Why are you still a Christian? You know, you're in these spaces where people, uh, like you, it's Russian roulette. You said you, you come out to them, you reveal something about yourself that is, you know, has been painful and has been confusing. And, uh, you know, people who are supposed to be marked by love are not always responding in love. You know, often they're responding with pain or with anger or with judgment so what is it about Jesus? What is it about the Christian faith? What is it about church that helps you or compels you to stay involved with it, to keep your faith alive and strong? There was a moment, and it was, it was around the time, uh, the end of college, the beginning of my post-college years, this was around the time that I felt a fairly final sense of closure in the realization that I was not becoming straight. Uh, that, that, that following God, that, that being excited about Jesus was not turning me straight. And, and it occurred to me, you know, if, if I have been perhaps lied to about this question um, by these people claiming to speak on God's behalf, if they've said like, here is the Lord's answer for your sexuality, he will make you straight, 
go for it. Um, if they weren't telling the truth about that, then what else were they not telling the truth about? And so I, so I really had to go back to, back to my own theological square one and say, what do I believe about any of this? Um, do I, do I actually believe anything that the Bible says? Do I even think there's a God? Um, if I think there's a God, do I actually think that, uh, my understanding of Christianity has like a true sense of, of who God is? And as I grappled with those things, um, I realized that, that the first question that, that I felt I needed to answer was, what do I think about the historical person of Jesus? Um, I was like, I was like, Obviously, there are lots of people claiming to speak on behalf of this historical person of Jesus. And, and I'm starting to realize that they're saying things in contradiction with each other. At this point, I have become aware that there is also a gay affirming narrative available. And I'm like, how do I feel about that? But I realized I couldn't even engage the gay affirming narrative with any degree of intellectual honesty until I had first gone back to Jesus himself and been like, what do, what do we think about this Jesus guy? Uh, and as as I as I sat with the with the, the the person of Jesus, what I read in the historical accounts, um, and I think even as I sat with some of my own feeling that in some ways my life would be much less complicated if I could just be like, you know what, this whole thing is a historical hoax. There's nothing to it. And yet, as I as I wrestled with those narratives, I found myself compelled. Uh, at the very least, I found myself compelled by the, the narratives of, of the death and resurrection of Jesus and the person that he claimed to be, I found it really hard to get around the idea that all these disciples of his who claimed to have seen him rise from the dead then went to their own graves and got martyred because they were so convinced of what they'd seen. Uh, I got so caught up in that story that I started to feel like, you know, I think, I think even if even if I find myself still doubting everything that anybody has ever said on behalf of this Jesus guy, even if I'm not completely convinced at this moment that I could walk into a church building and hear something true about who Jesus is uh, or about who Jesus is for me as somebody who's gay, um, I still can't get away from the idea that there's just something so compelling about Jesus that it would actually be worth me spending my life trying to figure out what it means to be one of those people who calls themselves one of his disciples. Um, and so for me, that that central question and and my my conviction about its answer then became the engine by which I could pursue any subsequent question about what does this mean for my life? How should I then steward my sexuality? Um, how, how do I then put up with the various people on all sides of the conversation who find me a somewhat dubious fellow? for you that you've been able to keep Jesus louder than the negative and judgmental voices uh, that you've encountered. Is that something that was just given to you? Like, was it a gift or have there been practices that you've developed over the years that have helped you ensure that your focus can stay on Jesus and not those who claim to represent him, but are full of judgment? Perhaps a bit of both. I, um, so uh, if, do you mind if I get nerdy about narrative theory for like 30 seconds here? No, no, okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, in, in narrative theory, in ways of describing how a story evolves, um, there's, there's this one particular model called Freytag's Pyramid that, uh, that depicts the evolution of a storyline, you know, and it, it starts with an, an exposition where we get the, the details uh, sort of laid out for us. And then there's this rising action where, where stuff starts to happen. There, there's a climax, uh, at the, at the top of this pyramid illustration, um, where everything kind of comes to a head and then you've got some falling action. And then at the end, you've got the resolution or the denouement. Um, and, and so there was an idea in narrative theory that you could map a lot of stories onto this trajectory. And you could say, here, we're at the exposition. Things are just being laid out. Oh, now we're at the rising action. This is the climax. Ah, now we've reached the resolution at the end of the story. One of the disciplines that I have found 
really helpful in my own life is to situate the particular experiences of my life as part of that ongoing story and to ask, okay, what, what part of the story does this moment fit into? Because I think if I believe, for instance, that in the moments that I experience the brokenness of a relationship where I used to have deep deep affection and intimacy with another person, and then as a result of the, the trauma of my coming out for one or the other of us, we no longer have that depth of relationship. If I tell a story in which that breaking point is the end, is the resolution, the denouement, is just me sitting in like a pool of tears after they leave, uh, then that is, I think, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a fundamentally uh, heartbreaking story. And yet, if I, if I have, the, if I have the, the wideness of vision to be able to see that moment as part of a much larger story, um, as simply uh, part of, and I suppose, I think for me, I would depict it as, as part of the, the falling action, right? I, I have already hit the, the climax of my life um, and that I can frame in terms of my, my, my dogged pursuit of who Jesus is, that commitment. Everything that comes afterward, all the heartbreak that comes with it becomes part of this falling action that I still have a sense will yet somehow resolve really well. Um, and, and I even have a deep conviction that that good resolution involves the restoration of relationships that right now to me feel really broken. Um, so the people who can't stand my guts, uh, it has become a bit of a discipline for me to say, not only do I think we will one day stand one another's guts, but I think that one day I still have hope that we will see one another as beloved siblings in this grand divine story. Um, and as long as I still have hope for that good, happy ending, then I don't have to let the sadness of this moment define the whole of the story. Yeah, that's really good. Hope I have found is central, uh, even to my faith, which has been fairly easy. But when we lose sight of the hope of the end, that all things are working together, that we're working with God to create a better world and better communities and healthier communities full of peace and wholeness, that uh, it gets hard to participate in the story of, of God. But with that, what would you but say? With that, how would you encourage to, someone who is currently going through the struggles of being in a community that maybe is not uh, totally accepting or understanding of their uh, sexuality or their self-identification? Um, are there things that you would encourage them to be aware of, things you would encourage them to look for? Uh, what would you say to someone in that situation right now? One discipline that's been helpful for me that I think can be even more helpful for those whose experience of hurt has been greater than mine is to, to make a really clear distinction between Jesus himself and the pursuit of Jesus himself and uh, Christian spaces, so to speak, and, and the institution of Christian religion, as it were. Uh, and so when I think about staying and leaving, uh, I find it really helpful to ask the question, like, staying with what exactly and leaving from what exactly? Because there are people whose stories I have heard who my advice is basically like, run as far away from what you're currently describing to me as you possibly can. Um, and yet, I think that it is possible to run away as far as you possibly can from a really unhealthy and abusive community that is claiming the name of Jesus uh, and to yet remain somebody who finds the person of Jesus compelling and wants to follow him. I, I mean, I, th I think one of the one of the beautiful images uh, that we that we get of Jesus' interaction with people who are beleaguered, people who are put down, um, is the idea that he uh, right he he doesn't he doesn't quench the smoldering wick, you know he doesn't he doesn't lay more burdens on the already burdened, um, and so I think uh, there are folks who need to who need to get away from communities that are overburdening them, communities that are seeking to squelch them, and they need to find a place where their tender flame of faith can actually be fanned back to life. Um, I'm, I'm still optimistic uh, that the pursuit of Jesus himself is actually a, a good and beautiful thing that has the capacity to fan our souls back to life again. Uh, but 
I, I don't want to suggest that every community claiming to engage in that activity is necessarily a healthy community to be in. personal struggle, uh, particularly with sexuality and race, are the two areas where I have differed most from my traditional communities, um, has been trying to figure out and understand the difference between enabling and influencing. Um, do you, you know, as someone who is staying in a place that, again, is not always traditionally been welcoming to either single people or gay people. I mean, both overlap there, right? For, for a lot of Christianity. Um, what does that look like? What, what would you define or how do you decide when you're influencing and when you're in enabling the harm of other people? You know, I think if I had perfectly figured that question out, I would probably have a lot <laughs> less angst about this conversation than I do. Uh, mm -hmm. because, cause I, th I think that continues to be, a point of tension for me. And it, it continues to be a place where I find myself sort of veering in one direction or the other um, and, and feeling like, oh, nope, now I now I think I need to do this other thing. Ah, never mind. Um, one, one principle that I have tried to live by uh, and, and hopefully will continue to do better and better as my life goes on is I think if you manage to be if you manage to be part of a community where uh, where things are occurring that, that you really think are not constructive um, and your presence there allows those things to go on without any discomfort raised because of your presence, um, then maybe you are just enabling. Um, so one, one mm -hmm. way in which I have wrestled with that particular question in my own life has had to do with questions around terminology for sexuality. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there, there is a camp, especially among evangelical Christians, though I think even outside of evangelical spaces, this uh, dialogue has occurred to some degree. People who would say, you know, we're okay if you're attracted to the same sex, but we would really prefer that you use the term same sex attracted instead of gay or queer or what have you. Uh, now, there are a variety of uh, a variety of components that go into that uh, seemingly somewhat simple conversation. And there are a number of reasons that I don't prefer the term same sex attracted for myself or for others. Um, but one one thing that I have wrestled with in the in the context of having ca having come to the conclusion that I've come and finding it constructive to call myself gay, I realized that if I were to call myself same sex attracted, that would largely have the impact of assuaging the discomfort of the Christian communities that I found myself a part of, um, of making them feel like, oh, well, he's here, but he's still using the language that we find comfortable. He still blends in pretty nicely with us. And so that's okay. We're fine with that. And I began to realize, I don't think I actually want to be that comfortable in these communities. And moreover, I'm not sure I actually want these communities to be that comfortable with me. Um, if these are communities where there's still an expectation that marriage is the higher and better and more beautiful thing and single people are somehow second-class citizens, and if these Christian communities are also places that seem to think that heterosexuality is like God's ideal and anybody who is LGBTQ is therefore somehow like a more fallen breed of humankind, as if we are not all equally inheritors of the fall of humankind, um, if there are ways in which uh, my use of language that uh, that makes these people feel comfortable allows those things to continue on unchecked, then maybe my choosing terminology that shakes things up a little bit is sort of like the linguistic equivalent of pulling a fire alarm, you know, just declaring by my very presence, by my very words, that something is not as it should be. To seek to become enough of a discomfort in the Christian spaces that I inhabit uh, that I can that I can invite people to rethink, to reconsider, to perhaps move a bit toward something that looks a lot more like Jesus. 
Well, Greg, thank you for the time today. Uh, it's been a great conversation full of wisdom and practical advice. Um, I love your story. I love the way that you have helped people. I love your courageous ways you have stepped into spaces that maybe have not been very inviting to you. So um, for those who want to find out more, learn more, where do they go to find your books and your social media presence and other things you're up to? Yeah. If you if you go to gregcoles.com or gregorycoles.com, they both take you to the same place. Uh, you can find a lot of my stuff there. You can also just Google my name if you're too lazy to put the .com on the end. I think that should get you to the same place. Uh, my books are called Single Gay Christian and No Longer Strangers is the more recent one, which came out earlier this year. Uh, and they're both on Amazon and wherever you feel like getting your books. Uh, you can track me down on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Sometimes I'm decently active on there. And sometimes I go through these seasons of being like, what is social media good for anyway? Absolutely nothing and say very little. Right. Uh, but either way, you'll probably catch me lurking there eventually. Why I Stay is a production of the Patheos Podcast Network, where we explore faith and gain understanding. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a five-star review on Spotify or Apple and go tell a friend about us. One of the things I appreciate the most about Greg's story is his own understanding that his experience has not been the same as many of his LGBTQ brothers and sisters. That's not to discount the trauma and the heartbreak he has endured, but it would have been really easy for him to expect everyone to be as gracious and as patient as he has been. Greg's humility and his story is a great reminder for all of us to be patient with others because we never know the battles that they're fighting. And don't forget to pick up Greg's books, Single Gay Christian and No Longer Strangers, by visiting gregorycoles.com or check the show notes. Why I Stay is usually edited and mastered by Clinton Battles, but this one wasn't. I did it. So if you notice a drop in audio quality or anything like that, I'm really sorry. Clinton's going to be back next week. Thanks for listening. <laughs>